That's all right. So, you're going to open it? Yeah. Okay, okay. You got your, you got your breath? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I do, I do, I do. Is this, do I have to? It's on. Hello. Ooh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, to blow, blow so loudly the first time. And I'm just much more comfortable not sitting down, so if you don't mind, I will stand up for this. And I just want to thank you all for being here. This is the first time that we've organized an event like this, and I hope it's productive. At least, we'll have a lot of questions that need to be answered. Oh, and I'm Delegate Kate Corey, and I represent the 38th District, which is Annandale and Greater Falls Church. I have asked the students to introduce themselves, and you all know my co-host, Sandy Evans, school board member for Mason District. I have just a couple things to say. I have been disappointed in the General Assembly a lot of times, but this session largely because we did not even discuss this issue. Um, largely because the um, majority party refused to put any of the bills that have anything to do with gun violence or school safety, any type of weapon. They just refused to put them on the agenda for any committee or for any conversation. And I have to say, this is the first time that this has ever happened to me. I've never seen it before in the General Assembly. So, almost every bill I put in didn't get hurt. And now I can't even say at least we can talk about it. But I, I was upset because the bills that came in from the majority party were all about turning our schools into fortresses and arming school staff, nothing else. Not to say that schools can't be made safer, I am sure. Some of them can be. But this is a much wider problem. And gun violence today is not only confined to schools, and it is a widespread social problem that is probably going to take us at least a generation to solve, if I can use that word. Um, in 2011, the General Assembly asked the Department of Criminal Justice and the Department of Education to convene a working group and answer many, many questions. And I have um, a whole lot of brochures here that are those agencies' responses to the General Assembly's questions. And there are all of these brochures, and there are seven of them, are on the back table so that you can pick them up on your way out if you would like to do so. And if something is gone, I can get more. Uh, in general, the, what would be interesting is the 20, 2017 Virginia School Safety Audit Survey results. And there are a number of brochures about emergency management, K-12 assessment in schools in Virginia, critical incident reports, and the educator's guide to planning and conducting school emergency drills. I think this is probably somewhat overkill, but I wanted to bring everything that I have. And I am about to close, but to say that I don't know how many of you saw the Washington Post article a couple of weeks ago that started out saying that this year has been more deadly for school students than anybody in the military. I'm sorry. It's very hard to imagine what it's like to say by your child and you don't when they're going to school and you don't know if you're ever going to see them again. It's ridiculous and a terrible, terrible statement about our society that this is the case. And I hope tonight we'll learn something. I, I believe the perspective of students is one of the most important perspectives that we can have. And after the students present, then we will have questions. And Sandy and I talked about a couple of questions that we thought would be important to be answered. So Sandy, I've talked long enough. 
would you please? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kay. Uh, I'm Sandy Evans, school board member representing Mason District, and I just want to uh, welcome you and thank you so much for being here tonight for this conversation. Um, I particularly want to thank the students for taking the time to have this conversation with the community and to give your insights as well. Um, I also see quite a few advocates, Mom's Demand Action in the audience. Uh, thank you for your hard work and uh, for all that you do. I think we'll be hearing more and more from, from each other over the next few weeks, months, and years. Um, the tragic events that we have seen in the past few weeks and months have not only been sobering, they have brought to the forefront an issue that we have known has been here, but that we have not been focused on nearly as much as we, we should have been. So um, we need to do more. We all know we need to do more, but I think when we have these conversations, the question is, what more do we need to be doing? Our school board has called on the superintendent to review all of our policies and procedures in all of our schools to see what more we can do. Are we doing, are we implementing our current security with fidelity? Those of you who um, go into our schools now know that you have to buzz yourself in. When my daughter was in elementary school, we didn't do that. We just kind of walked in. We could go in the classroom, you know, we could volunteer and that sort of thing. They didn't necessarily like that so much, Mrs. Barnes. <laughs> but parents would do that. Now, you know, you have to buzz in and the front office staff is supposed to look and see who you are and, and what you're doing there. Um, our um, schools have been reconfigured, the ones that are getting renovations, to make sure the front office staff can see who's at the front door. We have other security measures as well, but we have asked the superintendent to look at each and every one of them and bring us back a report and recommendations on how to improve. That conversation is going to happen in a school board work session in two weeks, uh, June 18th, starting at 11 o'clock at Gatehouse Administration Center. Uh, I, it's open to the public. Uh, it's not, uh, there's no public comment period there, but you are welcome to come and see his recommendations and hear the school board discussion about those recommendations, and we hope we will move forward. Uh, some of the handouts that I brought um, include a resolution that the school board passed recently calling on Congress and the state legislature to do more to regulate firearms and to deal with student safety, as well as some mental health issues. We cite statistics such as more than 150,000 students attending more than 170 primary and secondary schools have experienced a shooting on campus since the Columbine High School massacre in 1999, which is just an astonishing, astonishing figure. So I will just read to you the, the final uh, resolved, uh, therefore be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board calls upon the United States Congress and state legislatures, including the Virginia General Assembly, to prioritize the protection of students and school system employees by passing legislation that more effectively regulates access to firearms in the interest of public safety, funds public health research on firearms related issues, and advances mental health supports. So we are, are going to continue this discussion, and as I say, I look forward very much to what the students have to say. And with that, I'm going to hand the microphone over to our students so they can each introduce themselves and say a few words before we get to um, various different questions that, that they do have. Um, they have in front of them questions that Kay and I thought would be a, a way to get the conversation rolling. We also have a microphone there, and uh, for those of you who would like to come up and either make comments or ask questions, we welcome you to do so too. Oh, so, Sandy? Yes. All right. Sure. I want to thank all of you for the incredible pressure that you have put on your elected representatives to deal with this problem, and especially how many advocates like Moms Demand have been out in Richmond and, and made such a difference in the last election. Um, unfortunately, in terms of the General Assembly, we are shy of a majority in both houses by one person. So you have an even bigger job to do in the next election. You have to return everybody. 
that you elected last time and shift a few seats. Because until that happens, all these issues that are so important will simply be political, ideological issues, and we will not get to begin to solve the problems that face us. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Nia Rika Vaticonda, our wonderful school board uh, student representative. Thank you, Mrs. Evans, and thank you, Delegate K uh, Corey, for hosting me today. So I'll keep my remarks brief because I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your questions. So as Mrs. Evans said, my name is Niharika Vatikanda. I'm a senior at Thomas Jefferson right across the street, and I am the student representative to the Fairfax County School Board. I am really glad to have supported the February resolution to call on Congress and our legislators, uh, both at state and national levels, to focus on gun violence prote uh, prevention and gun control. And throughout the past few months, I've been working with a lot of students at different high schools and even middle schools so that they can expand their abilities to protest and walk out and really be able to speak out on this issue, whereas some of them were having some trouble with their administrations, but I've been working as kind of like a mediator in that situation. I'm looking forward to attending the June 18th work session so that we can discuss our security procedures further. So, sorry. Thank you so much. Um, again, thank you for hosting and letting me come speak here. My name is Dolly Lebo. I'm a sophomore at Falls Church High School. Um, I'm really looking forward to this and learning about everyone else's thoughts and um, giving my own opinions. Um, I'm passionate about gun violence prevention um, and women's rights. And um, I'm really happy to be here. So, thank you. Hi, and thank you for hosting us, like you said. My name is Mayada Hassan. I'm a senior at Jeb Stewart High School in Falls Church. Um, and I'm here today to advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves. Those who have lost their lives due to gun violence. Those parents, mothers, uncles, fathers. Just anyone who has experienced it. And I think this issue is personal for each and every single one of us. We all have our family members. We have siblings. You all went to school at some point in your lives and this is very personal to me and to everyone around me, I believe. So I'm really excited to hear what everybody has to say. Um, and yeah. Hi, thank you to everyone involved. My name is Lena Ibadi. I'm a senior at Jeff Stewart High School. I'm here tonight just to hear for my community and I think it says a lot about our county and our district for making this happen tonight. We are a leader in this issue. It's something that has haunted me since I was a kid. Um, we grew up with the topic of gun violence in our homes, on the news, in the hallways of our schools. So it's really important and critical that we're all here and I'm looking forward to tonight. Thank you. Hi, I am Fred Hagen Gates. Uh, I've prepared remote that's a little bit longer than the others, so I'll try and cut it down. Uh, I'm a, well, recently graduated senior from Woodridge High School in Prince William County, but today, here, I'm speaking as one of the founding members for the Youth Initiative for National Action. We are a nonpartisan group of high school and college students um, based largely in Prince William County, and we tackle issues such as racism, religious discrimination, education, and more recently, gun control and gun violence. Uh, if you'd like more information, we have a table in the back that you can go see. Um, our official stance, we are not against guns or against gun owners, but rather we're against the dangerous gun laws or rather the dangerous lack of gun laws that we currently have. Um, and as an organization, we hope to be able to work with elected officials in Congress and the Virginia General Assembly to target this issue in particular. There are a lot of solutions that have been proposed that would make this less of an issue, such as reinstating Public Safety and Recreational Firearms Use, Use Protection Act, um, creating stricter state and uh, federal mandatory background checks, and requiring private vendors and private sellers to perform background checks. Thank you. 
Um, I especially want to thank all of you students for coming here on a weeknight without, and we didn't drive you, <laughs> and, and we didn't even have to beg you. You were very eager to come, and I appreciate that. Uh, the questions that Sandy and I put together have basically fallen two categories. One is school safety, and the other is the rest of the world, making the rest of the world safe. So I would like us to begin, spend some time on both of those issues and not be totally caught up in the school physical safety issue, although that, that is important. And in order to get you to think about the society at large problem, I'd just like to tell you that there have been at least at least two recent studies. One was by the um, Center for American Progress, of looking to see if the rate of gun violence in general correlates with the strength or weakness of gun safety laws. And the answer is, invariably, <laughs> yes. So not only do we know this in our hearts, we have the data. And all we can do is work as hard as we can until something changes. So the first question that Sandy and I had put together was, please students, do you think the current efforts at your school to prevent gun violence are effective? And what ideas do you have for changing them or making them more effective? or doing something completely different. Go ahead. We'll start, start with yeah. you. Yeah, we'd love at to. the opposite end of the yeah. table, please. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So the current efforts at my school in Prince William County, so, so not really here, but it, there aren't really efforts. Prince William County has a part of the code, I can't remember it off the top of my head now, that prevents political groups or like political opinions from influencing school-sponsored events and activities, and it makes it very hard to raise this issue or to really make plans about gun violence. So essentially, it doesn't. There aren't really current efforts in Prince William County. The closest thing we had, we had a meeting shortly after the shooting in Florida, but nothing happened. They went talked about the issue and it was really, it was trying to make the kids feel better, but it never had the goal of accomplishing anything. Um, I'm sure this isn't just my high school, and I understand that this is a really uncomfortable topic, but that's what it's supposed to be. It is supposed to be uncomfortable because just how horrendous and just <coughs> horrific it is. Um, the current efforts, I don't believe that they are effective or if it's enough. I believe that in most schools there is this mentality where you can't speak about these issues or students are turned down. So I think moving forward, we need to allow students to be aware of their rights, of their political rights, of their right to vote, and just to be aware of the climate around them. So Lena and I go to the same high school, um, so what I'm saying is pretty much similar to her um, statement. Basically at our school, the climate is that you don't really talk about these issues um, on a school-wide level. Yes, we have a couple of clubs that do chit-chat about it. We have a club called Girl, Girl Up um, that advocate for women's rights. And they helped in organizing a walkout on March 14th, um, a couple of days or a couple, a couple of a month, about a month after the Parkland shooting. Um, and at that meeting, students also got to send letters to their congressmen um, and state legislators, but other than that, there haven't been any efforts um, on a school-wide basis. Um, just, I definitely um, feel the same way at my school. I go to Falls Church High School, and um, the issues of gun violence and more political topics are kind of taboo. Um, the administrators don't really mention them uh, in fear of being controversial. Um, and I think that's something that really needs to change. And having a discussion can really um, spark movement. And uh, so, uh, well, currently we have a mentor program that we're starting this year where um, upperclassmen are assigned a group of four or five freshmen that they have in their little group and they meet 
maybe three times a month. So we're starting that next year. Um, so I think that would be a good thing, but I definitely think it needs to have more push. I would definitely have to agree with a lot of the other panelists up here in that there isn't a lot of effort coming from administrations in particular to discuss gun violence, but I've been really proud of my fellow students in how they've addressed So at my school on March 14th, it was the senior gov field trip. So the entire class of seniors was in DC and, and then all the underclassmen, everyone else, they organized a walkout and our principal was very kind in allowing us to have those extra 20 minutes built into our class, taken out of some extra activities. So we were able to do that and have students speak out and march out to the football field and give their remarks. And all the seniors in DC, we, a lot of us went to the Senate Judiciary hearing on the Parkland shooting or participated in the rally, talked to our Senator Tim Kaine. So I felt like all of our action that we've really seen in the past few months has been very student driven and I'm proud of that, but I would like to see more at the administration level. Thank you very much uh, for those thoughtful answers. Um, I did want to let the members of the audience know that uh, feel free to come up anytime. Um, Kay and I have, have uh, developed some questions just that we thought uh, would need to be answered tonight, but we're happy to, to, uh, to get yours and as, as well as any comments that you may have too. So one of the things that we wanted to explore was solutions. Solutions um, to these issues. One of the things that we have seen in the past is um, very troubled people. I mean, I guess we could say in, in all cases, very troubled people coming into the schools, not just into the schools, um, but um, in other places as well. So one thing we wanted to ask you was whether you thought there uh, should be more uh, mental health counseling, uh, counselors in your schools, if you thought that that might be one approach to dealing with this, and whether this gets into uh, other issues, but whether you see um, bullying as an issue, social media as an issue that relates to this topic, um, or, or not. If, if the answer is no, the answer is no. But um, we just wanted to kind of throw that out to you um, as to whether you think that those are issues that need to be addressed more forcefully at the school as one approach to dealing with uh, violence of all kinds. And I guess we need to read I'll start with you. Sure, okay. So I think we should be very careful as to how we kind of relate counseling and mental health services to gun violence. So America is not unique in that we have mental health problems. Every country in the world has mental health problems. That's kind of a human thing. Mm -hmm. However, we're the only country that has gun violence at such like an epidemic level of seriousness in our to have thank you. To have that kind of level of violence in our schools means that there's something wrong that's not really a mental health issue. It's more of a lack of gun regulation issue. However, on the separate point of just mental health resources for kids, I think that's awesome. I know a lot of our counselors generally tend to be overstretched with like college recommendations and like getting kids in courses and things like that. So having those extra resources would definitely help kids um, to be counseled after a violent event or to help students who are dealing with bullying and things like that. And building a kinder culture at all of our schools would help with uh, the issue of bullying and some of the students who feel isolated in their school communities. But I think that we shouldn't really, I think that's a great idea just in general for schools to improve, but I don't think that that would be the solution for our gun violence problem. Thank you. Sure. Um. Uh, after having um, many conversations with uh, people and attending a student summit um, on Capitol Hill um, with a lot of students across Virginia and a whole group of students from Broward County and um, talking about different solutions, I don't, I don't feel that there's one solution. I feel like we have to address every topic, mental health, uh, gun regulation, um, you know, security, <coughs> Um, with kind of the goal that this is to help um, instead of, you know, looking for one and more um, looking for all and doing all that we can to help. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say I agree with um, what the panelists have said so far. 
Um, like Nihirika said, this isn't just a mental health issue. Um, and I do think we should be focusing on targeting our legislators and our Congress to push for more gun reform. Um, although I do think mental health is important to tackle, um, a school climate can really affect how a student goes about their day, how they enjoy their life, and how they see themselves in the school building. So I think mental health resources being more available at schools is extremely important, but I don't think it's the issue um, at hand here. Yeah. I completely agree with everything that's been said. I'm not sure how much we can burden our schools and our counselors on focusing on the topic, the topic of mental health when it's really much bigger than that. Um, we need to put pressure on our government officials. But the topic of mental health is something that needs to be explored and it needs to be put into place. Um, we've been on the Student Advisory Council for the past three years and it's always been a focal point in every meeting, but it's a lot of talk and we need to put that in action. Our students need the attention, they need the resources, um, and our county will only move forward through it. Um, but I do not believe um, our schools need to be tied down to preventing one person from doing something extremely horrible. So, I'm usually somewhat cautious with addressing mental health because while undoubtedly anyone who would commit a mass shooting has mental health issues, it's often brought up as something of a distraction because it is a complicated issue with no clear solutions. If you were to bring up background checks, there's a clear either you would impose stricter background checks or you would not. With mental health, there's no yes or no. There are many different possible solutions, many of which have flaws. And so it usually bogs down the process and makes it unlikely anything will get passed. And I feel that that's often why it gets brought up is as a distraction. So it, it is an issue, but I don't feel it is directly the issue at hand. And also I feel connecting mental health almost invariably to school shootings still very strongly stigmatizes those with mental health mm -hmm. and it makes people with mental health issues less likely to seek help mm -hmm. because they feel as if they are the problem and they are evil because of this medical condition they have. Mm -hmm. One of the other things on here that we didn't really talk about was if there's a connection to bullying and I feel that no, most, most of the time there is very little or no connection to bullying with school shootings. A lot of times people like to talk as if there is or use examples where there was, but for the most part there is almost no connection to bullying and school shootings. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to stay on the topic of what's going on in your school and what you would like to see a little bit longer I was distressed to hear that you feel the you experience or you feel that there is no conversation or opportunity for that in your school. But I think that sounds, I don't think that's right. I think in fact you do need the opportunity to talk about this problem, whether it is as part of the curriculum, which I promise you right now I'm going to look at and see if I can find a way. Uh, or as after school, talking with teachers, talking with students. This, is, this subject should not be taboo and it should not be considered political. So uh, I would like to know what you think could be changed uh, about the daily school experience that would allow some attention, some conversation, other than are you sad um, at your school? Please. I could. Are you so okay? I think the more politically aware I've become throughout my high school career, the more powerful I felt. I felt like I can make a change into the world. And it's the teachers that push me to become aware of what's going on in the world around me. The teachers who aren't afraid to speak about these issues that, like you said, are more than political issues. They affect people in every aspect of life. 
So we can't allow the topic of gun violence to become taboo. It needs to be something that is talked about even if we are uncomfortable talking about it. Moving forward, I like we've done such a great job as students all over the country bringing awareness to an issue that we're passionate about. And I think the adults just need to be careful with what they're saying and don't like push us away from what we want to speak about and at school, outside of school. And so that's something unfortunately that a lot of my classmates have experienced. So moving forward, I think that needs to be addressed just to create that comfortable environment. I think, oh, sorry. I think it's a very like school to school issue where, so fortunately at my school we have a very strong student government that the admin really like works closely with so we're able to lobby for things like having that 20 minutes of like letting students walk out without penalizing them or anything like that and letting them express their political opinions. Granted you might lose 20 minutes later in maybe your free period but our students were willing to take that on that they could protest. And I think that when you have a good relationship between the students and the administration, then you're able to get to things like that. And I think in a lot of our schools, students don't feel like they're being heard by the administration. They want to bring in speakers or things like that to talk about the issue. And they, they're feeling like they've been shot down because a lot of administrations are worried about being controversial. So I think that we need to kind of steer away from the idea that like gun violence is a political issue if you want to bring in a speaker to talk about their experience a speaker to speak about their political position it's not the school being political it's students having the opportunity to hear from someone of this position so i think we need to focus on that thank you oh wait i was just going to ask if there were questions on from the audience but i want to reinforce what you're saying um, I had the opportunity to talk to some of the Las Vegas shooting survivors um, during the session this year when I was trying to get a ban of stop bill heard, which I was not successful at doing for more than two minutes. But I think that you're right. There are universalities that are not political, that are not ideological, or not politically partisan. That we need to acknowledge as a society, and I don't think it's right that you don't have that opportunity in your schools. Sorry for interrupting, please. And, and I just wanted to follow up with what Lena said. Uh, Lena, you're absolutely right um, that students can have a huge, huge impact. We are seeing this. I have not seen the kind of activism since the 60s and 70s when I cut my teeth on activism. And I think um, your voices are being heard, they will be heard. And so I'm very glad to hear that your teachers have um, helped to empower you. Um, and I hope teachers throughout um, are um, encouraging and empowering students, whether on this issue or, or on others, just to, to be heard and know that it, uh, you, you can and will make a difference, so thank you. Yeah, so I just want to make a comment on the point that was made with regard to the differences between the different schools and different high schools and how some are more receptive than others. And maybe, you know, directing my comments to someone on the school board, you might be able to help. So I'm the student liaison coordinator for the Moms Demand Action um, chapter in uh, Falls Church, Vienna, and McLean. And um, there have been a wide variety of um, different sort of um, responses to us becoming active in the, with the students. Um, in particular, you know, I had one interaction where students reach out, reached out to me because they knew of our organization and asked me to come into the school to address their club. And the, their advisor said that it took, would take two weeks for anyone to be allowed to come in to speak to a, to a group. And I am quite convinced that it has to do with the nature of our organization that we were sort of not welcomed in to speak after school with those um, with those students. The other thing is, as you know, um, the Parkland students have been really mobilizing the red voter registration. In two of the high schools where we um, coordinate activities, one 
school was not allowed at all to have a, a student-led voter registration really? drive because apparently it was too political. <laughs> and another, the students, the students weren't allowed to do an additional voter registration drive because they we said it was... talk more about that because yeah. we do encourage our students to register to vote. That's not partisan politics. This is just no. everyone who can vote should be able to vote. And I believe, don't most of you, um, aren't you encouraged through your classes? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. In, my, to vote. Yeah, in my... So this was an additional... This was an addition. And the students were registering during their government classes, but the students demand action clubs that were involved um, in in the schools wanted to do some additional um, registration during the uh, lunch period I to try to gather the, the remaining students who hadn't registered during their, their government classes and they were denied. Yeah. Oh, but thank you for raising that because I, that's that's something I can certainly follow up on. And I, I'm interested that um, it was difficult for you to get a time when this, this was an after school. This wasn't during school, it was after, after school. I would have thought that that would have yeah. been fairly easy for you to come in and, and speak with them. And um, they, there's always a, the possibility of talking to your uh, school board member um, yeah. if, if, that's, if that's an issue. So thank you for, for raising this. Um, I would like to add one more uh, comment on, on this particular subject. And this is a timely uh, insight for me to have. So thank you, student panelists. Tomorrow, I no, Wednesday, I'm going to Richmond as a member of the Civics Education Commission. And we are going to be talking about what initiatives and follow through that we need to have in our schools. And it would seem to me that encouraging voting and awareness of the power of voting ought to be in every civics curriculum. And also woven into a number of other areas in the curriculum. So I am going to be happy to bring that up this week. Thank you. Um, I would like to sort of comment on that. Is I personally am not surprised that there was difficulty having voting registration additional or at all. Um, while at my school, my government teacher certainly encouraged us to get registered to vote. Yeah. Outside of one it wasn't even like a voter registration event, but at one point at the beginning of the year, we were able to register to vote, and then there was, but it was early in the year, so several people had not, were not old enough yet. After that, there was no real opportunity to, and they never provided any other method to try and register. And that's really a problem in Prince William County, is they, I don't want to say like they try and suppress the student vote, but like they really try and limit political activity. <laughs> For instance, uh, Moms Demand Action has a, not just sister organization is the right term, but Students Demand Action. They are not allowed to be in Prince William County schools because they are too political. So we do not have any, that, that's why I'm part of the Youth Initiative for National Action is because we cannot have Students Demand Action. So this is, we are not a school affiliated organization. We don't work with our school. We meet in our free time and try and recruit people outside of school because we cannot be affiliated with our school. I find that um, really unfortunate because I have such a great principle um, that my friends and I, two girls, we organized uh, during the week of the April 20th walkout. During school lunches, we had um, League of Women's Voters Fairfax yes. come on to campus and it didn't take time to get them on because they're, they come into the Gov classes and um, we kind of got the last sweep of 24 students registered to vote during lunches. Um, mm -hmm. That was really awesome. And I'm so sorry that I didn't have that opportunity, but um, it was I, really I awesome. I think it was the League of Women's Voters who came by, but it was like in October or November, and then they never came by again. So it was yeah. very difficult for anyone who wasn't 18 at the beginning of the year or the first few months to register. Yeah, they come during like the end of the school year, so most people are 18, and then we kind of got the last bit. And Dolly, I think you, you helped uh, organize that voter registration drive yes. at United Falls Church, so congratulations Thank for, you. for organizing that. Go ahead. Oh, I, I've got lots of things going on in my head. Um, I'm the first one to just follow on and say it's a fortunate state of uh, 
discourse and also certainly a global discourse given where we are, that a conversation is defined as political when you're simply exploring a topic. So that's unfortunate and I like that you were here talking about this fighting against that. And the only way to change that is to continue talking. So I'm encouraged that you're here doing this. Thank you. Um, Sandy, you had mentioned that this reminds you a great deal of sort of the uprising of political sentiment in the 60s, um, which intersected a little bit with one of the many thoughts I've got floating around, which is, um, you know, I'm here with my kids, my son's in middle school, he's very near a position where people are asking him to speak at a panel, yeah. as wonderful as his thoughts are. Nobody is certainly going to be asking him to vote anytime soon, not soon enough anyway. Um, and my daughter, who's in elementary school, and certainly nobody's asking for opinion on these matters either. Um, when you are in a position where people are not going to listen to you, they're not going to take your vote, they're not going to respect your vote, you're in a political minority, whatever else the case might be, you have to act differently, which is what happened in the 60s. And protests are visible, but they are not action. Um, a lot of what happened in the 60s were much more about conversations, much more about sit-ins, about writing, about increasing discourse, about talking with people, more about the issues that are going on, and about local actions that you can control, trying to work within your sphere of influence to make a change. And I think, particularly when we take into account exactly how long it's going to take to, for any political change to happen, not that we should not push for it, um, there's going to be, if we are talking simply and specifically about gun law changes, there are going to continue to be guns that are out there that maybe should never have been issued in the first place in the wrong hands for quite a period of time, no matter what we do. So what can we do outside of law change? And what's in your sphere of influence um, that you can think of? How might you approach that problem? And how are you approaching the problem if you um, Great excuse question. me, would you please, because we're videoing this and it will be up on the Mason District Council website in a couple of weeks, would you please introduce yourself before you sit there? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I'm Jessica Ward. I'm in Alexander and my kids are Sam and Sierra at Bailey's Upper Elementary in Glasgow High School. Thank, Thank you for being here. Yeah. Who, who wants to start? I can sit you the answer. Don't sit down, stay there. Yeah. So I think that when we look at what students can do besides kind of the protesting and walking out and the voter registration, I think it's on us to make sure that we're kind of unpoliticizing the issue, if that makes any sense. So in our schools right now, we have this idea that, oh, like voter registration done like just in your gov class, not talking about any of the issues, completely sanitized, is completely fine. But when you want to have that conversation about what we can do about gun violence, that's like, oh, that's got to be outside of school, kind of an extracurricular or something like that. So I think that within our sphere of influence, we can work with our administrations, work with our student governments to host some like panel discussions, like round tables of students of different political views yes. who sit on all sides of the spectrum, kind of like this kind of situation, except more of a discussion format and see how students can learn about each other's opinions and really try to get some, try to find some common ground, I guess would be a good idea. Thank you for your thoughts. Your kids are really lucky to like look up to you as a role model. But while we are on the topic, um, the teacher I was speaking about briefly earlier, he loved the idea of the walkouts. And he's like, you guys are doing a great thing, but what ne what's next? What's gonna happen next? And he really opened up my eyes because I was like, what is next? We are walking out. We are protesting for something we, be we believe in, but the elections are coming up. Mm -hmm. And so that's really when like my head did like a little 360. And I was like, I need to encourage my friends to register to vote. Mm -hmm. And we need to be aware of what's going on around us. So Delegate Corey, thank you for all your efforts in trying to make this into something that is in the curriculum because to be honest that is the most effective way to reach the most people and it needs to happen so thank you i'd like to follow on for a second just to point out to everybody that public schools are probably the only institution in our society where almost everybody meets everybody else it's the most effective place to have a conversation and to get to know somebody who doesn't think like you and 
whom you've never met before. So we're going to have to work on that. Please, thank you for waiting. And, oh, don't forget to introduce yourself. Oh, Did oh were there oh, yeah. others? Oh, yeah. 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 You have to what? jump up and down or something. <laughs> so, like Niharika said, unpoliticizing the issue, I think it should be one of our top um, tasks in this gun reform issue, um, as well as mental health and just tying it away from this gun issue because it is more than just that. Um, and it definitely, I think, comes down to like a school to school basis. In my school, I think that we have, like, our student government is very strong in communicating with our administrators, and a lot of our teachers are very open to talking about issues, whether it be gun law, gun laws, whether it be women's rights. Um, just anything, our teachers are very willing to talk to us and open to conversation, which I do love about our schools. And that is what public schools are about, just having the conversations. But I do think we can build the climate where it's more common and even building it in our curriculum, I think would be more important as well. Uh, I would like to agree that it would be great if this issue would become unpoliticized and we'd be able to talk about it more freely in schools. However, like the very nature of this issue especially with the way it's talked about on the national level and the sense it's so similarly talked about on the local level, it's almost inherently political. And so it is very hard to discuss it in schools. And as for what students can do, it's very difficult to do anything outside of these protests or registering to vote. And maybe it's just that, you know, Prince William, I'm not exposed to many other options. But even just protesting seemed very hard. The first walkout, we were not able to take part in or we would be suspended. It took talking with the superintendent and with all the principals for weeks to be able to take part in the second walkout. And even then, unlike some schools where it was a rather political issue, we had to stay very strictly nonpartisan. It was not a walkout about guns. It was a walkout specifically to honor the victims and nothing else. And Anyone who talked about anything else could get in trouble. So it was, they, it was almost impossible to even discuss the issue. And I sort of mentioned earlier that they did eventually, like two months later, have a meeting to discuss school safety. But the intention of the meeting was to reassure students not to even propose solutions or any sort of way to move forward. Can I say one more thing? Okay. Um, well. We were part of organizing the walkouts uh, the past couple of times, and we sat with their administration, and they were willing to hear our thoughts, but they were hesitant. And they were hesitant because they feared us losing academic time, and I completely understand that. So I think that is why it's so vital to make voter registration a normal throughout all high schools, throughout all pyramids. <laughs> I'd just like to remind everybody that these exemplary young people sitting up here, and don't be offended, but you are young, especially compared to me anyway. Um, you are the leaders. You're where it's going. If you can't talk about it in a public forum, we are really in trouble. So I want to renew my commitment to finding every way I can to allow you all to share your opinions with each other on this issue. And thank you for waiting. Yes, I have like a little something to say. Sorry. Um, unfortunately, at my school, um, we don't really have a student government. We don't have a, a gap, or we have a gap between the student leaders and the administrators. Um, at Jeb Sturt, you have an SGA, a student government association. Um, we just have our leadership classes. We have young Democrats and young Republicans, but they're very inactive, both of them. So. I think um, something that I can do, I'm only a sophomore, so I have a few more years mm -hmm. to kind of get what I need to get done. Mm -hmm. um, what I can do is, is work on bridging that gap and making our voices heard at, at a very, very local level right. in our school that we go every day. So right. Let me know how I can help you, Dolly. Thank you. Okay. Um, a good thing to do. I just, I want to sort of apologize for bringing up my district, which I know Prince William is not Fairfax, so I know there's not much that Fairfax School Board can do. Yeah. But I would like, since a member, member of the general, yeah, House of Delegates is here. I feel like hopefully the Virginia General Assembly right. or somehow this will be public enough that my school board could hear to remove that code that prevents uh, 
political activities because we don't even have an inactive young Democrats or young Republicans. We can't even, even in some one, an organization that doesn't do anything would be better than what we can do. Don't apologize for bringing up your school system. Uh, we are part of a commonwealth and maybe individual school systems, well for sure, individual school systems can make improvements and differences, but it really has to be the commonwealth. The laws that we're all interested in changing are almost entirely state laws. So your school system and what happens in it, and especially to you, make a big difference. My name is Ruth Amberg, and I've had children in the Fairfax County School System for the last 25 years or so. My youngest is currently a junior at Dev Jeff Store right now. Um, there's so many good ideas that have come up here, just even opening up and having a discussion. First off, I have to share, mental health has been a stigma my entire lifetime. Right? So just because it's associated now with the gun violence conversation, the stigma of getting help has been there forever and a day. That in itself is its own issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just your problem, we are a community, right? So we get a question about what can you do, what are you thinking? It's not just your problem, it's every parent and grandparent and child's and community's problem. So please don't feel that we're not doing what you can. I mean, we're all there to help as a community. But I really stepped up with the question because what I keep hearing about is, is mental health and gun control. There have to be other ideas, right? In your conversations, what other ideas have been discussed in the community aside from those? I'm really curious to hear because it's not just one solution. It's got to be, I think as you said, it's a tiered solution, right? And there have to be boundaries and different protections all along the way as backup of what you're saying and so forth. Yeah. So who wants to take that? Oh, yeah. that, I want to say that that is one of the questions that Sandy and I had on our list. But what do you want it. the larger society to do for you to help you um, what, advance this nonpartisan cause? Well, actually, my question was beyond gun control and mental health. Yes. Yeah, right. So um, Fred, it sounded like you wanted to start. Yes. So I feel one of the issues that it seems like it's limited is both mental health and gun control are very, very large issues that have a vast number of sub-issues. Gun control could be about gun bans. It could also be about background checks. It could also be Outside about... Outside of that, what are the other solutions that you've come up with? Right? Is it putting well, a yeah. policeman in every school, the resource on? Is so, it, and who have been very helpful? Is it, you know, we're saying if you see, say something, you know, hey, you're making people feel more comfortable in reporting. I mean, what are the other list of items aside from this? So you, you probably, just as background, you probably know that all of our high schools and middle schools do have a, a school resource officer in them. Our elementary schools mm -hmm. Do not. Um, if you, if any of you wanted to, yeah. So to, um, to talk about that a little bit. So we met. We are on the student advisory council. We meet with Dr. Braygrand every once in a while. Um, in one of our meetings, it was shortly after the Parkland shooting. We met with the head of security for the entire county, and he actually told us that elementary schools do not have school resource officers. And I remember immediately getting chills because I have siblings who go to elementary school. And I understand that, like, as an elementary schooler, I remember seeing an officer and I was like, what's wrong? Is there something wrong in my school? But it's necessary. And our county, I do believe that we have what it takes to make that happen. And for the high schools, why just have one school resource officer when you have to cover so much of a building? You need to guarantee the safety of the kids first. And what makes our elementary schoolers any different? It was very, very disturbing. Um, I think our county is better than that. Um, so sorry if I wasn't exactly on your question. I was just trying to say that those two topics are very large and have many subtopics. But in terms of other solutions that I personally saw, after the uh, Parkland shooting, they did sort of go over lockdown drills and what it really means, because apparently it has always been that uh, first high, then there's also a uh, 
sort of flee or fight hug, but they had never really emphasized that. They had always emphasized unlocking the door, turning off the lights, and not being visible. Now they also uh, talked about possible escape routes. Um, it was a little funny in math class. They talked about potentially using windows, which I'm not sure if it's the same in this county, but for Woodbridge High School and several schools in Prince William, there are no windows oh. in the school. There was what? the doors, there was oh one God. by a stairwell, but no classrooms have windows. So it was almost a joke <coughs> considering that as an escape. Hmm. Uh, but we talked about escaping along fire drill routes. We talked about um, using the cupboard and the bookshelf to barricade the door or to rush past out the door if they were to get in. But outside of, apparently that had been on the books. We just never really discussed it. But outside of discussing that, there wasn't really much done. We do have a school resource officer, naturally. We also have a second officer there. I'm not sure what his title is exactly, but there are two officers at our school. Um, I'm not sure if that's normal or not. So Fred, Fred, you've opened the door for one of the things we were going to ask you about too, was to what extent at your schools you have, um, each of you at, at your schools, have had drills. Do you have regular drills? Are they effective? Do people, uh, I mean, I know it could be kind of a, it, in some ways it might be more scary than, than not having them to have to think about it, but but do you regularly have those or do you not? Yeah, we, we have the fire drill once a month or however often it is, um, and we also have like a tornado drill once a year, but we have the past I'm not sure if it was this year or if it was also last year, they kind of blew together a little. Uh, we started having lockdown drills more frequently. It used to be maybe twice a year. Now it's getting close to as frequent as the fire drills. So that no matter what class we're in, we generally know the procedure and where it is safe to hide in the classroom. How about the rest of you? What, what's your experience been on that? So I know, like, so in Fairfax County, we also do similar lockdown drills, like close up lines, turn off the lights, like sit in the corners and be quiet. But I think that a lot of our students, so we understand that specific drill. So what you do if you're in a situation where you're in the classroom and then you uh, hear the alert to a lockdown. But I think that a lot of our students, quite honestly, I, like, I think a lot of us have no idea what we would do if we were in that situation during passing period, during lunch, after school, before school, or if we happened to be out of the classroom, like in the library, the bathroom, during the actual, like once the school was put under lockdown. So I think that a lot of the lockdown drills we do are very effective if everyone is already in a classroom to begin with. However, there isn't a lot of preparation for students in the highly likely chance that you may not be in the classroom at the time of this horrible event. Thank you, that's a good point. I would like to add that we're going to hand out index cards for people who have questions that either you're afraid we're not going to get to, or you are not comfortable asking. And what Sandy and I will do is if we haven't been able to respond to the questions, then we will in writing in our newsletters. So please, and you don't have to put your name on Unless you want to. If you want to put your name in your email so you can be sure you get a specific answer, feel free. And thank you to Kathy Hartlow, um, my executive administrative assistant, and Danielle Sims, uh, Delegate Corey's assistant, uh, for being here with us today to help out. So the, I, do, the, the, I, um, okay. I, I just wanted to comment and say that that is a very good point about when the drills take place. For instance, both fire drills, lockdown drills, or any drill does not take place during the lunch periods right. at my school. So yeah. during the middle of the day, I don't even know the fire escape route from my science class. That would seem like a pretty big flaw. What about uh, the students from Falls Church and Stewart? What, what's your experience on this thing? I would say that the fire drills and lockdown drills have been pretty much staged, I would say. Um, everyone's sitting in a classroom and everybody knows there's a fire drill going on or going to be at 11, 12 this one day because everyone's talking about it. Teachers know about it. We just know and everybody knows it's coming. You sit down, you're quiet for about a minute or two and then the principal releases us from the drill. Um, but something I do like that my school does is 
Along with having, I think, two SROs, um, student resource officers, we have our all of our administrators um, plus a couple of other assistants um, in the school stand in the front of the school building every morning. Um, and as students walk in, they just see everyone, greet people, say hello. But just having them stand there in the mornings makes me feel much safer when I think about it. Um, our school is pretty small, it's about 2,100 people. Um, so everyone pretty much knows everybody. So having them walk in or having them stand there, they know basically every face um, and some names, of course. But having them stand there in the mornings um, definitely creates a climate of safety. Yeah. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think Fred and May ought to brought up a great point where um, we've been doing fire drills and lockdown drills and tornado drills since we were young. Um, but at the high school level, they do feel staged, and I think that isn't right because those could happen at any time of the day. And I think it does come back to losing that academic time that our adults in the building are so scared of. But if we prioritize these things, Academics are just as important, but so is this. This is also an important matter, and I'm not sure how much of a say like the students have in communicating that to the adults in the building. Um, but that's definitely an issue as well. Dolly, did you want to say that? Oh, um, uh, just to agree with Fred, uh, I don't know where I would go during lunch, passing period, um, wow. and they're kind of not taken very seriously. I've had teachers during lockdown drills, um, they turn off the lights and close the door, but we continue with class. Um, kind of just graze over that as that's uh, something that routinely we have to do and it's not taken very seriously. I mean, in the past few months, it's kind of had more of a grave vibe, but um, I think that that's something that we can do is prioritize uh, this matter. I'd like to call your attention to two of the brochures that I left in the back. One is Bus Driver and Monitor Safety and Security Manual, which has procedures and questions that come from the Department of Education as well as the Department of Public Safety. And the other is the Virginia Educator's Guide to Planning and Conducting School Emergency Drills. And I'd especially like students to hear what you think of these documents, okay? Because if you don't think they sound like they're going to help anybody be more effective. I would really like to know. Yeah. Hurry up. Get up there. <laughs> Before somebody else says something. So it's interesting. Um, hi, I'm Beth Tudon. I'm with both the Fairfax County PTAs and the League of Women Voters. So I was at another meeting, so I'm sorry, but you talked about voter registration. Um, so we have this high school voter registration in Fairfax County. Last year there were 1,600 students registered. This year we have over 5,000. Wow. So, that's great. And I hear you like you mentioned one school. We did actually end up going in there during lunch. Um, the model that Falls Church High School actually, um, we worked with, with them, and then we did that at Madison. It, it's great to go in the classroom as well. You really need a multi-pronged approach with the PTAs. The parents know the social security numbers. With um, going into the classroom, it's great to talk about voting and that sort of thing. Um, but we feel we've done a good job. There are probably 9,000 or so students out of the 12,000 who are eligible, so there's still more to reach. But um, anyway, we're, we're getting there. Um, but Problems, some do see it as political, um, but if you don't get registered, you don't vote, and if you can't vote, and if you can't vote, you don't count. So, um, as far as Prince William goes, the League of Women Voters does go into high schools there to register voters with the American Bar Association. I don't know if you have seen that. Are you in the yeah, that, that was the one that came at the beginning of the year, but I felt it was, because a, a lot of people I knew were weren't ready, weren't weren't ready age, to age eligible. Yeah, a lot of them just they weren't able to because they were both they may have been in May or June and they came in November or October and so they didn't right. even if they could, they didn't think they could and so they ended up not doing it. So in Virginia, after the election, so after the general election every November, anyone who's seventeen and maybe eighteen by the next election can register and then vote in a primary or a special election. Yeah. 
So one of Sandy's um, colleagues um, ran in August in a special election, their special election for school board. Her son, Jordan, had just um, said, this is Karen. Um, and her son had graduated from the CPS school, had not gotten registered, and but he registered to vote in that election and voted for his mother first, for the first time. Uh -huh. And he was still 17. So we were, we're trying to get to more of the CPS schools. But anyway, so in November, as long as they come after the election, so this year is November 6th, but November 7th on, everyone's able to register. It, it might have been then this is just the perception I got from my class. There might have been, you know, every other class might have had huge turnout, I guess. Because it, right. it came during Gov classes, so. Oh, okay, this is, they have different models, but this actually, they have an auditorium that they do there. Yeah. Whereas here, we do government classes. But, um, so anyway, you, but any, any of the schools, we can come in and we can help. We don't get tied to a, an issue though, it's the only issue when we're doing it during school, just the league can come in. Um, but we have gone in and to a lot of schools just doing lunch that students have asked us to do or to a um, epic stay or senior breakfast or something like that. So students and we were at TJ um, a couple of weeks ago to get registered for students. They all go TJ had already had. The opposite elections come in. Oh yeah, I remember the speaker event. I think a lot of students registered to vote then. Unfortunately, yes. I think I'm like the only senior who happens to not be 18. Unfortunately, oh. I'm, like a few <laughs> weeks after election day, like. Oh. But yeah, your November 22nd actually. Oh. So I will be waiting oh, until God. November 7th just, to yes, register. Just, wow. I know. Oh, wow. Okay. But well, there is a student at Edison who contacted us about doing this for the registration. So we're working with him. His birthday is November 6th. 2000, so he's oh, our poster child. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, he lucked out. But it's been very helpful to have, like, multiple voter registration drives. Yes. Because even though uh, people speak about having, like, you can register and vote in the primary and special election, if you have that in, like, November and then, like, December and then January, a few times, like, right. kind of hammer it in, then a lot of kids will pick up on that. I know my government teacher since, probably since... December has been telling all of us to register to vote and vote in our primaries. We get almost weekly emails from him. He's my favorite, one of my favorite teachers. So um, that has been very valuable because now we all know we are, the, at least my friends who are able to vote, they're picking up absentee ballots before graduation, filling them out, and then before they head out for their after graduation plans, they'll have those in. Right. Well, so, yeah. I'll say one other thing. And so, that, so if you go to the league website, we have the high school voter registration challenge. And every FCPS school is on there. So you click on the link for Jeff Stewart. It will change July 1st. <laughs> um, you know, Falls Church and all of that. So it goes right to the Department of Elections website, but that's how we're tracking. Oh, so good. we're tracking the, you know, the students who are registering. If you have a driver's license or learner's permit, you can register online. Otherwise, you can register there, but you have to print and mail it in. Or someone in the link can come in to do that. But as far as if you're going off to college and voting, so applying absentee, so my son's out of state, and he called me, which scared me. Oh, yeah. Because he called, he wasn't texting, he was wrong. I said, what, 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 what is he saying? He said, I, what, mom, what, what happened? He said, I, I, what? He said, I need a stamp. Oh. <laughs> so said, what? Yeah, what is that? He said, I need a stamp. I said, what are you talking about? He said, for my absentee ballot. Then he went on and on and on about how that was a poll tax. But um, <laughs> then he wanted to know where to get a stamp. So if you're graduating, um, you could ask when someone says, what should we get you as a present? You want to ask for stamps. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for that voter registration drive and for providing one stamp. <laughs> your child has one more vote. Yeah, I'd like to say that I think the uh, registering doing lunch would be a great idea. I'd, with which we have tables set up outside the lunch table where it seems every day if there's not a dance or some sort of fundraiser, there is an Army, Marines, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, or National Guard recruiter there trying to recruit people. So I think say, mm. I, I should try and contact them, well, I graduated, but I should, I should try and find a way to contact them to uh, set it up so they could me doing lunch, I feel that that would be a great way to get more registrations. Yeah. I, I have a um, friend whose 
I just met you at Woodbridge High School. She's principal at Yeoman. She's having a meeting tomorrow morning with the principal. So she just texted me. I'll text her back and ask her. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yes, my name is Paula Halliger. I'm a former educator. I am up here from South Carolina. I am a member of the League of Women Voters. I am active in Indivisible Florida. I have a question for the board member. We, you have a curriculum. You teach a curriculum. When did it become politically incorrect to do current events? You have a unit on the Holocaust. You have a unit on bullying. You have a unit, uh, unit on transgender, transgender or uh, your sexual courses that you teach. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that somewhere along the line, we as Americans have uh, an inability to discuss with each other. Mm -hmm. um, our children are not hearing the current events. Mm -hmm. They are at a loss. And I would like to know whether your board would consider bringing back, allowing the teachers to be political, if not political, at least to discuss gun violence, at least to hear about Parkland, not from a mother who's calling you hysterical on the phone, are you safe? I think we've done a terrible injustice to our student population. So I think that uh, the answer we do have to have our students be able to discuss current events of all kinds. Um, I wouldn't call that political, though. I mean, I would, it's, it's not partisan politics. It's not a Democrat or Republican. I would say that, um, that we do need to be able to discuss the current, you know, any kind of current topic. Um, and do you, you not, would, do you, you would call these students? I bet uh, right. my thought would be that none of them has what we would call real-time current events. Do any of you do current events? Do you get into school and the teachers are talking and you're in a forum and you answer questions? And so I know you have leadership classes and you have government classes. Um, do you hit on sensitive topics or current events as part of that or does that have to, to currently happen all outside of your school hours? So officially, no. Officially, the curriculum never touches on any current events. Mm -hmm. Unofficially, a teacher does uh, discuss current events in the government class, particularly mm -hmm. you know, any current laws or court cases that have come up that might, especially if they pertain to our current unit. Um, but oftentimes, every couple of weeks, we'll just have a discussion of current things that have happened, but it is not part of the curriculum. I almost feel kind of bad about talking about it because it was always kind of off the books that we were talking about it. Yeah. So what about the others of you in Fairfax County? What's your yeah. experience now? So I actually moved to Fairfax County before seventh grade and I distinctly remember kind of the switch. When I was in elementary school, we had to write a current events report. Like that was the big assignment. Like in elementary school, you don't get a lot of grades, but you did get a grade on that one. Mm -hmm. So every one of us, we would pick a current event issue and then write something up, or I guess talk about it, maybe like a show and tell, I'm not, I don't really remember. But in middle school and high school, we didn't really have that at all. So we, like I had civics class in eighth grade, and you know, you discuss like the branches of government, things like that, but there was never really a focus on actual current events. All the kids who were interested in current events kind of joined like Model UN or debate teams, but that kind of self-segregates the kids who are interested in current events and prevents other kids from like wanting to get interested in current events. Although I have had some pretty awesome teachers this past year, there is a special senior like seminar and each student joins a group and they pick different issues ranging from like prison reform, sex education, my group's topic was chronic absenteeism for younger kids. They give us a lot of leeway with what we were allowed to choose and talk about and take local action on. So I think that while it's not officially really practiced too much, we've had some really awesome teachers who definitely tried to make, keep it part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to say, I don't, I just want to say that our teachers really are very great about this because it is not part of the curriculum and sometimes they're even discouraged from talking about this. But most, I'm pretty sure all of us probably have had a teacher that took it upon themselves to discuss current issues such as this and without any sort of approval from the school board or official statement. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was,
Um, thank you for your point. I do find that I don't like the argument where teachers aren't allowed or there's a stigma where teachers aren't allowed to give their input because we are in an education system. Like we are and we are learning in the grades that we are. We are in a building to learn and having adult perspective on things is just a part of that growth mindset and it's there for a reason. Um, I don't know what we can do to remove that stigma away, but I've learned so much from the teachers who have taken it upon themselves to educate their students beyond the classroom. And I think you can agree with me, Mayada, that it's those teachers that are really respected throughout the school. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're fortunate enough to take a class called Theory of Knowledge. Um, only about 70 of our seniors take this class and it's because it's required for a certain diploma which is the IB diploma. Um, theory of Knowledge is a class where we talk about ethics, morale, um, science, just any subject in the entire world and it gives us an open space to have discussions about anything really, everything and nothing um, and our teacher is very comfortable with having these talks with us but for the most part they're student led and um, conversations and it's only led to the like, growth within our classrooms and I'm fortunate enough to take that class but I would love to see possibly more seniors or maybe even having it become a requirement for students to take that class or having something similar to that being implemented in schools um, whether it just be a requirement for one year or anything by any chance. Yeah. So Paul you've raised a really interesting issue and that's something that I can take back to our board and discuss this because I guess I was under the impression that more of this was discussed in government classes and even in history classes. So if, if it's not, that's something that we should have a conversation about. You know, why are, are we not having more of these conversations mm -hmm. about what's actually going on in the real world today? And Eureka, I appreciate your perspective as somebody coming from a, a different jurisdiction. Uh, so thank you for raising that. I uh, appreciate that. I'd like to say that that theory of knowledge class sounds fantastic, mm -hmm. and I'd like yeah. to see something yeah. else. Yeah. 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 It's a great class. Even yeah. if it's yeah. not required, just yeah. as an optional elective, I'd love to see a class similar to that at Woodbridge. Um, sorry, Miss Evans. I think it's like important to keep in mind that for some schools, I guess our school, government's required as a sophomore, and then you're free to take whichever history you can. And so, mm -hmm. I think what we need to do is make it make it acceptable for teachers, no matter the subject, to give input on subjects like this. And I understand that that's hard just because of the curriculum, but I think that's where we should be headed. Or at least to have the conversation. Exactly. They don't have to give, um, for sure. they don't have to, to say this is the right way to think. Right, it, right. They can open it up. Allowing yeah. conversation. Wait, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. but we, yeah. we really need to let the people who've been standing here waiting ask their questions. And there will be time for, um, I hope, brief closing remarks. So if you have a point that you really wanted to make and you weren't, this is directed at the students, uh, and you weren't able to make it, please do it then. It's, it's fine. So I'll keep mine short. Oh, that's all right. It's more of a compliment. My name is Shakira Rock. Um, I actually just moved from North Carolina. So, background: when I was in sixth grade, we were involved in this in a school shooting. So, mm -hmm. to tell you about that, it's very quick. We had teachers just pull students from the hallway, or didn't know what was going on, and it was a complete lockdown. Mm -hmm. So, my compliment is that these students who are young and not necessarily in power are given the platform to talk to express and then the people in power have this authority to listen to them and actually make change. So that is my compliment and I just want to say I appreciate that and I appreciate the adults that are taking time to listen to them to actually implement things that obviously them and the students under them can take effect. Thank, so thank you. 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 Please uh, go ahead, and then after this question, I have a question that was passed up to me from someone who's not old enough to vote, but I do need to read. Okay, first of all, I have a couple of comments, and then there's a question coming behind it. First, well, first, I'm, my name is Deb O'Berg. 
and I am a retired teacher from Falls Church High School. My daughter went to Annadale High School. She lost one of her best friends at the shooting in Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. I take this very personally. Um, my first comment as a former government teacher is that local government gets very short breath. In fact, it doesn't even get brought up. Even though the government does not have an SOL, they were required to give common final exams. What was on the final common final exam was what got taught. And I would bet a lot of kids don't even know the power of local government and state government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the other thing, especially at a school like Paul's Church that hasn't been renovated forever, <laughs> I mean, yeah. teachers wouldn't even, a lot of times, take their purses into school. One of the reasons we were given for why we could no longer take cell phones away was because we couldn't keep them secure. And the schools were getting angry parents saying, well, the teacher took it and then it disappeared and the school should pay me for the phone. So I have been poor about that. I'll let you, you go to my feelings. A lot of the attention that has been given nationally to solving this problem with school violence is to arm the teachers. In your opinion, would this be a good thing? And two, is there anything that a teacher in your school could have that a student could not get hold of? You're a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> we know you. Thank you so much. Seriously. So personally, I believe that teachers should not be armed. There are much better ways we can deal with the problem of gun violence. I mean, for starters, removing guns from the hands of people who could be inclined to start these shootings would be a starter, in my opinion. And, and then focusing on, rather than arming teachers, if we are really going down the direction of how to keep the school secure, the idea of having like being buzzed in, making sure that the identity is being checked of like whoever is entering the school, things like that to keep the school secure, but not turn it into like the idea of teachers being armed in a school turns the school from a place of like secure learning and things like that into somewhere that's slightly more <coughs> slightly more I don't prison? want to I, yeah, I, I don't want to say prison like, but along the lines students will feel there's a difference between a student thinking, oh, there's a door out there with a buzzer to protect me from someone who might be coming in, versus, oh, all my teachers have guns and like they're going to fight off an intruder should they enter. I think there's a, a lot of things that we can do to avoid taking that step of arming teachers, and I think that unless we've exhausted literally every single possibility for anything else, and we shouldn't even be thinking about that option. Right um, now it's illegal? Yes. And so you just want to be sure you all pay attention if the polls, so we can keep it illegal for teachers to carry arms in school. It is illegal for there to be guns on school property, even concealed carry, even though we have had some legislation attempts this year at allowing anyone who has concealed carry privileges to take that weapon onto school grounds. So and, we need your help. And even if it were legal by state law. Uh, Fairfax County Public Schools has our own regulations that prohibits having guns on school as well. So do I, how, how do the rest of you feel about the issue? I agree that no, I do not think that that would help the issue. Uh, you mentioned that cell phones be taken away will go missing. I'm assuming that they would be stolen or lost. So I would not trust that a gun could be secured if the phone could be stolen or lost, that a gun could be stolen or lost by stolen or lost and then found by a potential shooter. So I do not think that would make it safer. On the topic of like more secure buildings, this is a legitimate suggestion I heard was to put a fence all around the school and have the only entrance be some sort of gatehouse with an on go. And that's a prison. You're de they were describing a prison. And there was already a joke at Woodbridge that it is a prison because of the no window situation I described. It is often they joke that we're in a prison because of that. I don't think we should be working to make it easier to make that comparison by putting us under armed guard at all times with a fence keeping us in. 
I do not think that would be good for the stress and mental well-being of the students. Um, Thank you. We're being reminded that it's 8.35 or maybe even 8.40 by now, so I do want to read this question. Before you oh, do that, Kay, I just wanted to tell Debo we did get Falls Church on the bond, so we're starting. Um, All right, the question is, and this is titled, Question for the Panel. Have you considered putting hidden metal detectors around all critical areas? I might be reading this incorrectly, but I think I've got your, uh, your, the gist of what you're trying to ask. Uh, that doesn't shut down the school, the metal detector, but it is, it is set up so that the front office can know I assume what you mean the results of whatever happens if someone passes under that metal detector and there's a problem. Okay. I think was, was that clear enough that y'all can respond to it? Yes. Okay, I um, think that's. Oh. Do you want to go first? Yeah. Is that okay. okay. Yeah. I think that's an interesting suggestion. That's definitely an idea that we should be looking into. That's not an idea that makes students feel like they're in like in the in a prison the way the army teachers would. Mm -hmm. And I think that maybe some some of these more balanced options deserve a second look. And I think that we need to make sure that regardless of what we're doing and what ideas we're considering, we're making sure that we have the data to see whether this measure actually works. If it does right. thank you. If it does then if that kind of situation, if that kind of system definitely does help reduce school shootings, I'm all for it because that is not something that kind of oppressively affects a student's day. But if there is, I, I think that's part of the reason that we're having that security review of all the procedures, so that once we understand what our procedures are, what Dr. Braver and, I, and FCPS particularly suggests, then we can see how to incorporate strategies like that with the data behind them. Uh, the idea of metal detectors, have I considered it in that, have I ever thought of that idea before? Yes, I, at one point I thought about that, but I also thought about how it would not be feasible. I mean, I'm not sure if the situation is different in Fairfax, but at Woodbridge, we do not have computers for every class, and so English classes have sort of moving laptop codes to type on. Several times, especially near the end of the year, they were very requested for SOLs, so my English class did not have it, so my English teacher told us to bring in our own computers. So I walked into school with a laptop in my backpack. That would probably set off a metal detector. My backpack has lots of metal all over it, from buckles to zippers. That might set it off. My calculator that I have to bring for calculus, it might set it off. I mean, if it's as sensitive as the stuff at TSA, at airports, I have lots of stuff in my backpack that would be constantly setting it off for no reason. Metal pens, uh, you know, metal rings in my binder, metal spirals on my notebook, yeah. all sorts of metal all throughout my backpack, in my pockets, I have a phone, I have a wallet with coins and all sorts of stuff in it, so like, there's so much metal that I carry on a normal day yeah. that if they were hitting metal detectors, they'd be constantly going off. I think there's a way to adapt that system, though. Like, as technology improves and as we have, like, better image recognition uh, software for x-ray scans and things like that, then we can maybe avoid that problem where it's not just, like, all metal that's being, like, that's triggering an alarm. It's just when you put your backpack through or what have you, then it's, it's actually looking through the x-ray scanner, seeing what the item could be and then triggering an appropriate response based on that. So I don't think it would be, I think that if we can, we can work with the feasibility of something, we can work on the implementation of it. I think we just need to be sure that whatever we're doing, it's actually going to help us in the long run. Um, to add to that, I would say that in a perfect world, having these concealed metal detectors would be amazing, but obviously, like you said, funding is an issue. So I definitely think um, school safety um, procedures and um, yeah, procedures in general should be overlooked once again and it should be a large part of our school budgets. Um, obviously FCPS, we've had our <laughs> trouble with dealing with budget in the past couple of years as I've learned in SAC, um, but definitely upping our budget and really making school safety a priority um, could definitely be a possibility for us. Mm -hmm.
I think what you brought up about budget is an important thing because I like to focus on more laws being passed because it is very hard to get, it seems to be very hard to get funding for education. I mean, our schools, some of Prince William County schools, the history textbooks, still have George Bush as the current president. We don't have the laptops for every, school, for every class like I mentioned. We have desks that fall apart in overstuffed classrooms and people are trying to own um, teachers and put in metal detectors when we don't even have funding for the basic necessities of our school. That's no, I, maybe that's so, a, oh, Julie, did you have a question? Um, yes, um, good evening. And, and mostly I'd like to uh, share a resource and issue an invitation. Um, I'm honored to serve on the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Public Education. Mm -hmm. And we have a publication called Addressing Gun Violence, mm -hmm. um, Law and Public Policy Health Approach. And this publication, um, which is also online, uh, discusses a community-based uh, approach to addressing gun violence, as well as a health approach, um, as well as using smart technology issues. But the most important thing that you've been addressing is confronting controversial issues in the classroom. So I would be happy to get copies of this. This is online. There's also get copies. Yes, get copies. Yes, there's also the Standing Committee on Gun Violence that um, I was a part of the advocacy going back to Columbine. I'm just destroyed that we haven't been able to do anything. So as you go about your debates and conversations, please take a look at that. And then I'd like to invite you to a conference that we're holding in Chicago. It's the National Law-Related Education Conference, and the topic is free speech. And I, I'm chairing the subcommittee on this, and a lot of the panels are going to discuss how we can have these controversial conversations in the classroom mm -hmm. and uh, respecting each other's position on that. Are so, any of the, uh, oh, I'm sorry for interrupting, yeah. but are any of the sessions or resources going to be uh, a webinar or uh, recorded so that someone can access it and it's not there? Right, these are in person, but I, there's probably some funding available through PTAs for teachers to ask for a grant to be okay. able to go to these conferences, and perhaps there's some funding for student government um, leaders to also attend. Um, and I just wanted to add the plug for the IB diploma. My daughter is an IB candidate at Anadale. Mm -hmm. And the yes. theory of knowledge and the IB uh, program is extremely important. So I'd love to hear your further comments on, on uh, promoting IB, which basically uh, creates world citizens. Yeah, so IB, um, first off to say, is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the IB diploma is one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Um, but it teaches you to kind of look at your classes, whether it be math, science, history, or English, with a broad perspective. Um, we talk about many different issues. We look at the, the IV curriculum is very strict in that our writing has to be written in a certain way, but um, it helps in that we get to look at different resources. Um, they make us watch videos, look at books, listen to TED Talks. Um, so many different things, and we look at so many different resources, all to come up with one common idea. Um, uh, yeah. Do you have um, I do believe that the IB program should be an option at every school, just because it's unique in the way that it allows for a connection to the real world in every subject, and it's cr it's helping make students just better learners in every aspect of their lives and it's more than just the classroom and so that is so unique and that is what we need to push in our classrooms for high school and beyond yeah i, oh. I would agree that i think the ib program sounds good we do not have it at woodbridge i'm not sure if we have it at all in prince william county i think it should be implemented it sounds great i think potentially at the state level it should be try to implement it as some sort of statewide program, I think it would really improve education for the whole state. I think your ideas are good. Uh -uh. It's a, also a question of resources. However, a million years ago when I was on the school board, I was part of getting IB at the high schools we have it at now. And it is a wonderful program. But what I really want to say is that my children who have IB diplomas have all told me it makes your freshman year of college so easy 
and you say to your friends, what's wrong with you? Why can't you do two papers tonight? Because you already know how to write and how to think and critically approach your subjects. So I encourage everybody here to write to everyone you elect or whom you've already elected. And let's get IB in more schools. Hi, my name is Langston Carter. I actually came here with Fred. I'm the founder and president of the Youth Initiative for National Action. I have more of a comment than anything. Uh, Fred mentioned earlier that Prince William County has a policy about politics in school. Uh, the policy is 273.1, and it prevents any individual or group from voicing political opinions in the classroom or at school sponsored events. Uh, and I think that the issue of censorship in schools goes beyond Prince William County. I was actually supposed to speak at a school in Fairfax a few weeks ago, but uh, administration said that that wasn't going to be allowed, uh, supposedly because of time restrictions, even though that they, they had already told the uh, students that if they handed in the paperwork by the day they handed it in, then everything would be fine. Uh, I think the real problem with student involvement is schools don't uh, encourage it enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could just ask you, was this during the school day that you were supposed to speak? Uh, no, it was at a uh, after school club meeting. It was an after school club meeting. All right. Yeah. Um, should get in touch with you. Thank yeah, you for raising that. I think we definitely look, need to look into that, looking at how we have our policies for each of our schools, because I know that what worked so. We, like when we were working on organizing walkouts and things like that, we didn't really have the opportunity to, like in all these situations, go through all the different policies at each of the schools. So what we did is we found a school that was receptive to it and a school that allowed for the walkout and allowed for the protest. And then we took that to other principals and said, okay, this school is doing it. This is how it worked at this school. Like, can we do that here? And once we had like an, a, a sizable number of schools that were on on board with this, and we were able to convince more principals and more administrations to participate. Um, go ahead. I know with um, coming to my principal about this uh, voter registration drive, um, he was very, um, although supportive, he was hesitant, and I know that he was telling us to wait until he met with all the other principals of other schools to kind of come uh, out as a front and have a similar opinion. But um, so I definitely agree with him. I would agree that it's a problem with them not encouraging enough. How about I'd say in some schools, the problem could go even further to them not only not encouraging enough, but actually discouraging student involvement. And the, the, I just want to say that the scope of the problem is very significant, and it varies from school to school, from teacher to teacher, from principal to principal. It can really be difficult for students to get involved. Hi, I'm Annie Levo, I'm Dolly's sister, and um, as a middle schooler, I think that I'm sort of like with the elementary, middle school level of understanding of this topic, and I feel like younger kids, more than high schoolers, do not understand it as much, and really understand the capacity and the seriousness of the topic. So like in one of the walkouts, when I went up with my friends to sort of like put my opinion out and do it. A lot of the kids were just running around and just being loud and used it as an excuse to get out of class and not really uh, like pay respects to what was actually going on. And my friends and I, we sat down and we were silent, you know, thinking, thinking. And one teacher who respected us came up to us and he said, thank you. I really appreciate what you guys are doing, and I wish the other people would understand. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, how do you think younger kids should become more involved? Because while they're younger, they don't they don't really have like, the resources and the thought process to do it on their own. Because mm -hmm. high schoolers go forward on their own when they're not allowed to in class. They look it up online, they talk to their friends, but younger kids don't really want to mm -hmm. say that kind of topics with their friends because their all the opinions they know is from their parents mm -hmm. and they don't really want to be like messed with because of it. So. Great question. Yeah.
unfortunately, I think it's kind of sad that like kids, even at a really young age, have to learn about the seriousness of this issue. I guess in a perfect world, you wouldn't have to feel like that because we wouldn't have this issue. But I think the best way for younger kids to get encouraged, I think, is through partnerships with older students. So when you're talking about expressing your opinions and not wanting to have that affect like social life at school, I think it would be a good idea to have like older kids, maybe for elementary schoolers you get middle school kids, for middle schoolers you get high school kids to moderate the discussion to kind of set the example. So you have an older student that's saying, guys, we need to respect the seriousness of this issue. Let's actually have a meaningful discussion rather than, like you said, like running around and not really respecting the seriousness of the issue. So I think with that kind of mentoring and that support from older students, you'll have that better climate to discuss. I just like to say my sister organized her walkout at her middle school, and so she shared your same frustration. Um, and I do think it does get better with age. People don't understand the political climate at such a young age, but the mentoring is very important. Looking up to the high schoolers and look, looking at what they do. And my sister reached out to my friends, and she was like, "What are you guys doing at the high school level?" We shared some ideas, and they were able to formulate a more organized walkout. But again, she had the help of teachers who really cared about the issue. And creating an organized protest, you can really send a message that way. But you need the help of adults who really care about something. Yeah, I think one of the issues with younger students versus, I mean, high school students calling them order is a bit of a leap, but versus older students has to do with uh, parents often want to sort of protect their children and not tell them about the world. And unfortunately, this is a little depressing, but this issue is becoming more and more common. And it's been, however, since 1999 uh, in Columbine, nothing has been done really to solve this issue. And if nothing is done and the issue continues to exists the way it does, eventually parents may have to just change the way they protect their kids and they may have to tell them about those issues. They may no longer have the luxury of sheltering their children from issues like this. Sorry for this. Just... So as we're ramping up here tonight, we were going to throw one last big question out at you and then also give you an opportunity just to say whatever parting words you might have. but. Um, because you've got um, Delegate Corey here, you've got your school board member here, what would you like for your federal officials, your state officials, your local officials, your school board officials, what ideas of what would you like for us to do? And, and also just any, any parting words that each of you might have. And we can go a little bit longer. We, I'm, I'm not gonna, uh, I, we don't have to shut it down at exactly nine, so, so don't feel constrained by this, but we'd love to hear your, your last words on this. Um, you only get to speak once, okay? You can't okay. buy it later. <laughs> go ahead. So I think that the biggest thing we all need to keep in mind for our legislators and everyone who is essentially in serious positions of power in changing this issue is the idea of common sense. There is a lot, there is the Second Amendment, there, is all, there are all of these beliefs, but we, I think we can all get to a point where we agree on some basic things like background checks, protecting our students in our schools. I don't think those are really partisan issues. I think everyone wants to send their kids to school and have them come back, maybe complaining about their homework, but not fearing for their safety in their schools. I think that once we have that kind of, once we agree as a society that we are ready to approach this issue from that point of, there are parts of this issue that are just common sense that don't really require us you to be on one side of the political spectrum or another, then we can make meaningful progress. And until then, I encourage like all the ad advocates in the audience and all the student advocates who are probably watching, going to watch this at home to keep fighting the good fight, to reach out to all of our legislators, keep putting pressure on everyone from Washington to Gatehouse to make sure that we are doing everything in our power to get this issue out of our schools and out of our lives completely. Because personally, I know it's not just an issue that affects our schools. Growing up, I was born in 2000, so my entire life, Every, everything is no longer safe. The movie theater, the mall, 
everything that we would consider places of fun, you have to kind of watch your back and look around and say, maybe this isn't the safest place. So I think that with time, with our efforts, we can change that so that maybe one day our like, students can go to school, to the movies, to the mall, and not feel that sense of lack of safety. I think um, something just to keep doing is asking questions. I know that I never would have learned about this topic, um, about any of the issues that I'm now passionate about, um, LGBTQ plus rights, uh, gun violence prevention, women's rights, um, labor rights. I never would have uh, even been aware without asking my parents, um, asking my teachers, asking my peers, and by learning different opinions and different perspectives and having these conversations, which we've been uh, stressing this entire night, we can learn more and um, find our own passions within these topics. And I'd just like to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm very excited to take a lot of these um, ideas and motivation back to my school and implement everything in my power that I can with my uh, two years left in high school. Thank you. Um, as me and Rico touched on earlier, I do think this issue is not left or right. It's an issue of morale. Um, students' lives are at stake here. People's lives are at stake. And I think we need to always remember that. I think our state legislators need to stand up rather than hide behind closed doors. I think people, us, students, parents, family members, the community as a whole needs to keep on having this conversation and stand up together because this issue is only going to end when we work together collectively as a whole. Recently I've learned that a lot of adults have been reluctant to listen to um, some of the student voices and that breaks my heart because this is a student issue. It's happening in our schools. Not only that, but um, it is happening in our schools and I do think we need the support from our elders and from state legislators from our government to really move on with this issue and grow in any sense. So um, I'd just like to thank you guys for this opportunity and for the younger kids, if there are any younger kids left here, um, just keep talking about the issue, do your best to learn about it and keep the conversation going. Thank you. Um, a message to our legislators and government officials, please stop ignoring us. Um, the conversation is there. We are sending you letters, um, but we are coming to the voting polls very, very soon. Um, it really isn't up to a school district to determine if um, gun violence is something that needs to be dealt with. We need government officials to take charge, um, but I am very grateful to have grown up in a county in a district that has taken the initiative because I've never seen anything like this through all my education here. So thank you to everyone involved. Um, thank you for having me. I'd like to say sorry. I think I talked a bit too much on some of the questions. Uh, no, no, no. no also, not at all. No. The, thank you. Uh, the question we have here also lists some of the potential solutions, and I'd kind of like to go over them. Stronger enforcement of existing gun violence prevention regulations and laws. Yes, I think that would be great. One of the, I also might be slightly more partisan in this comment. Uh, one of the issues with that is that whenever the ATF, the alcohol, tobacco, firearm, and I think explosives is also in there, uh, whenever they try to do something, they are often hamstringed by Congress and prevented from doing anything. Uh, so I think the, we need to write our congressmen or vote to allow the government regulatory bodies that are meant to regulate this, allow them to regulate this. Uh, new laws, yes, I would also support new laws that would help reduce it. Um, increased funding for gun violence prevention measures, yes, I would definitely support increased funding for gun violence prevention measures. I mean, there's, there's a list of them, but for the most part it's, yes, I would support this. The problem isn't that we're usually that we're doing the wrong thing, is that we're doing nothing. And I would love for this to be a non-partisan issue, and in many aspects, it is non-partisan. Everyone wants to prevent gun violence, but I, I think it's somewhat naive to really consider it non-partisan because those issues with new laws or enforcing current laws 
is partisan. One side will support it, the other side will not. And everyone wants to prevent gun violence, but they seem to never agree on any method as to how. And I think it is very important that we get involved, we write, we vote, we protest, we campaign to get solutions. And one thing that's not on here, but something that I'd like to see my federal, state, and local officials do is not let this fade away. Because for the past, I've only been alive 18 years, I've only really paid attention to the news for the past 10 or 11, but for those 10 or 11 years, there would be a shooting. It would be talked about for weeks. There would be petitions and trying to get a bill passed in Congress. It would go to committee and then it would stay there for a month and then the petitions would calm down because, oh, it's being talked about. It would never leave committee, it would die. And then the next time there was a shooting, several months later, same thing happened, petitions, protests, huge outcry. They talk that they're going to talk about it, but then they never even fully get around to talking about it and a month later, it's gone away. It's getting to the point that these shootings are becoming so frequent that before it's even gone away in a month, there's another shooting. And so what I would like from state, federal, and local officials is don't let it fade away. Keep it current. Keep talking about it. Don't just wait for it to quiet down and return to your normal issues. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank our student leaders for coming out tonight. I want to thank everybody um, who participated in this conversation. It's been a great conversation. And uh, you are great student leaders. So I will be bringing back these ideas to the school board, particularly when we have our conversation in two weeks. I know Nina Rico will also be uh, very active in, in that conversation as well. And Fred, to your point, no, we're not going to let this die. We're not going to let this fade away like Thank we've you. seen it have in the past, because you're absolutely right. We have seen it come and go after, after Columbine, after Sandy Hook. No, we're not going to let that happen anymore. And with your help, with your voices, your voices will be heard. They can and will be heard. So thank you so much. For your thank you. I have a challenge for you students. Would you do this again with us in the fall? Please. <laughs> Yeah, yes, please. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, please. I, I would love to, but, but I may be in college. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. okay. I'll be yeah. if we'll, I'm we'll get here, Dolly back. Um, I would yeah. definitely yeah. We want will do, okay. to do we'll this. Do all so. we yeah. can plan this during our fall involved. Plan this during our fall break, and we'll all be here. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. We'll be back. We'll be fall break. <laughs> Ooh, I should figure that out. Seriously, I mean, I I do think. This is important. You all have been really, really eloquent presenters, and this is what we need, this mix of conversation. It, I'm sure everyone here has now got uh, some new insights and perhaps a few things that you'd like to work on that you hadn't really thought about before. I know I have a whole list here. Um, and as a part of not letting this fade away, let's do this again, okay? And I also want to thank everyone, and I especially want to thank Kathy Parvo and Danielle Sims, who spent a lot of time on logistics. <laughs> and didn't argue, and we said, do this, do this, do this. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this has been put together kind of quickly. Uh, I just, after the session this year, I thought we have to do a lot more locally, and I'm so happy that Sandy Evans was willing to be part of this effort, and she is willing to be part of this effort to do it again, right? And, and the other thing I want to ask all of you is please tell Sandy, tell me, what you think we can do, I mean, I have a list of laws that I'd like to see put in, and I'm happy to talk about them, but how can we help keep the conversation alive in a way that's not just the same old, same old? Because that's what, that's what we want to do. We want people to be thinking about it and to be looking at their daily lives and think about how can this effort be part of what I do 
every day, because that's how it has to be. So I challenge everybody. I hope I hear from you again. And again, thank you so much, especially um, moms who would be happy to give out t-shirts to anybody <laughs> who doesn't have one. And don't forget to email me, email Sandy, with your comments and questions that, excuse me, that we might not have gotten to tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Delia. Yeah, this was better than I thought. Yeah, this was better than I thought. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm 